Hello, uh, I am uh, Rien van Genuchte. Uh, I uh, will be giving a little talk on uh, some of the issues of water resources and uh, arid environments as part of the international conference. I very much appreciate uh, having been invited to participate. Uh, I am uh, uh, been working for many, many years uh, in California, especially on numerical modeling of subsurface water flow and contaminant transport, uh, transport processes. So I would like to give a little bit of an overview of some of the tools that we developed for this purpose. Uh, right now, I'm partly in Brazil and also have some connections still with uh, my home country here in the Netherlands. I want to first start with uh, what I would call an abstract of my talk, which is a, a plot that was uh, uh, published in a book by Mary Beth Kirkham uh, about the uh, world population. You can see here that uh, the uh, number of people on this planet uh, were about uh, between, uh, between uh, about uh, one half billion. Uh, but then in the 17th, especially 18th, 19th century, it started going up. This is probably correlated, although I don't want, to, don't want to say that too loudly, with the challenges we have in managing uh, this planet. But we can also, instead of billions of people, we can here then also uh, plot uh, on this scale the challenges we have in terms of managing agricultural, arid environments, freshwater issues, think about pollution and so on. At the same time, we, have we are understanding so much better what's going on. So on this curve also, we could here plot our insights into the challenges we are facing. Uh, think about the science, the awareness, uh, global collaboration and so on. So this will be an issue whether or not we stay ahead of the challenges that we're facing. I mentioned that uh, I worked for many, many years uh, at, uh, it's what's actually called the U.S. Salinity Laboratory. And our focus was really on agricultural challenges. Uh, and then uh, very much connected with that also uh, environmental issues. And so we have been changing the surface of the earth very much. And the focus here would be on the Vedo zone. Some people call it also the critical zone. And the more water we uh, include for our uh, groundwater resources. And of course, very important, the uh, vegetation uh, near the surface. And we have been increasing the vegetation or the surface really uh, for many, many, uh, in many, many, many ways. Uh, deforestation here, you can see agriculture, roads, construction, urbanization. Uh, some other issues here, I'm not gonna go uh, through all of them then in, in the, uh, too much detail, also don't necessarily believe all the numbers exactly, but they will give a, a pretty good idea about the degradation issues of the land surface, salinization, point and non-point source pollution, and so on, urban pollution, of course. But the one thing that I'm very much concerned about is this uh, fourth uh, set of uh, uh, issues here, that the Capita, uh, the amount of water per capita per year is decreasing quite rapidly. You know, it used to be more than 20,000 cubic meters per year per capita. Now we have barely or probably not even 5,000. So it's decreasing more and more. And then the per capita arable land for agriculture uh, is being decreasing also very severely from less than, from about uh, 0.4 hectare in 1970 and they estimate uh, uh, about 0 0.15 uh, hectares per capita uh, in 2050, which means really that we have to increase the efficiency and productivity of arable land. For me, when we uh, addressed some of these issues, we uh, did a lot of experimentation, but also numerical modeling. And the numerical modeling was based on, and I'm not going to go too much into detail, but there are really through three equations that uh, we've focused on. One is the Richards equation, actually a 
pretty famous scientist also at the salinity lab where I worked uh, for water flow in variably saturated porous media, uh, where we have here a number of parameters that uh, uh, reflect how water is being held and the hydraulic conductivity. We also have an equation to address uh, contaminant transport. Uh, of course, there are lots of uh, agricultural chemicals as well as industrial chemicals. Think about uh, uh, nitrogen or pesticides uh, and so on uh, that we can try to model using this equation. And then sometimes we also include heat movement. This work over the years has resulted in a number of uh, software packages. The most important one being the hydrous models that uh, considers all of these processes at the same time. Uh, we also have a Red Sea retention curve, uh, which looks at the description of these nonlinear parameters in the Richards equation, the water retention or PCS curves and the hydraulic conductivity, which is very much a function of the water content in the unsaturated zone. Yeah. And then we have a, a other model that we simplified where we really look at only advection dispersion, uh, contaminant transport, where we say that the uh, water flow pro uh, processes are linear, uh, constant flow, and we also look only at uh, water flow. And I'll give you one slide showing a little bit what that stand model. So it stands for a studio or suite of analytical models. Uh, and the simplest of simple equation that we have is say, the advection dispersion equation. And we did some experiments here and then we tried to fit the uh, parameters in this equation are being the retardation factor that uh, uh, reflects the absorption. In this case, it would be titiated water, basically like water movement and hexophilic chromium. Uh, and there would be a still a little bit of a retardation of the chromium. This worked well for uh, homogeneous, uh, very homogeneous soil systems, uh, but in many cases we had trouble. So we uh, could not fit necessarily the data with that particular simplified equilibrium model. Uh, and, and this very often occurred when we had a, uh, what we call a dual porosity medium, where we have large pores, small pores. In this case, we would have uh, uh, dead root channels or gopher holes, or worm holes. Uh, but uh, think also about aggregated soils, think about fractured rock and so on, uh, where we would not get these nice sigmoidal breakthrough curves. And then we uh, changed the equation, the uh, governing equations to get uh, something that would give a better fit. Of course, these models, analytical models were modified later, uh, 2D, 3D, we included degradation, uh, zero order production, but as long as they were analytical models. More general though, uh, the focus was on our hydrous codes uh, that we developed, we really uh, worked with these now about what, uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, this gives an overview of the various processes. Um, again, the Richards equation for transient flow in variably saturated media. Uh, root water uptake critical in agriculture, but also many environmental uh, applications. Think about global climate, think about uh, evapotranspiration and so on, where we included uh, various processes, including compensated uptake, passive and active solute uptake that uh, would be very important for uh, phyto extraction of phytoremediation problems. And then contaminant transport, you know, Many of the processes that we have with agricultural chemicals, and I hate to say, but agriculture has always been the biggest polluter of all, you know. Uh, but we try to really understand uh, and minimize the effects of uh, uh, various processes. And so you can see here some of the things that we included in the hydrous codes, including virus bacteria transport, colloid and colloid facilitated transport. Uh, uh, we coupled the hydrous models with the Freak C, so we get a, a lot of capability in addressing multi component transport models. Yeah. And a few other things we included, for example, uh, uh, some databases that made it much easier for people to look uh, at uh, uh, real 
time uh, problems, uh, uh, some guidance about the uh, PCS and or the hydraulic properties here. It's called pedo transfer functions, also for water uptake. And then everything was placed in a interactive graphic based uh, interface uh, uh, environment, the GUIs. I want to show you one or two, two really two different applications. One where we looked at the uh, problems of uh, fresh water. You know, of course, that goes back to the earlier slide. Uh, the uh, challenges are enormous. And you can see here two slides, uh, one from some devastated agriculture area in, in West Africa, another an abandoned uh, irrigate, irrigated field in Mexico. But these are really symptomatic of many other cases. Uh, we even have in Brazil uh, quite a few of these uh, in the northeast uh, uh, of these uh, abandoned irrigated fields, you know, India, Middle East, North Africa. Not only fresh water issues, but also the contaminants. And one of them where we worked and really focused on a lot was uh, salinity. In two cases here, this is a uh, a really a, 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 a heavily salinized field in, in Colorado, mostly because of upward capillary flow from the groundwater table from uh, layers that were uh, in a natural way very, very saline. And so the water evaporates, the salt stays behind. This is uh, very common in many irrigated areas, in this case with uh, furrow irrigation. So this is in the Central Valley of California. It's at somewhere between, uh, between uh, uh, Los Angeles and Sacramento, San Francisco, and a little bit higher. Uh, but uh, that was there uh, causing a lot of uh, salinity problems, you can see here, uh, because of uh, an inadequate uh, disposal of uh, drainage water. And so this leads then to the question whether these traditional irrigation methods, especially furrow irrigation, but also sprinkler irrigation, it's a little bit more efficient than furrow irrigation, but not necessarily the perfect way either. But you can see here in the furrow, the water, uh, when you have uh, aggregated soils or soils, uh, when it is saturated, you can have a lot of drainage. Uh, you have a lot of interaction with the atmosphere. And so the efficiency of using this water is not uh, uh, the greatest. And so then the question arises whether or not the surface irrigation methods are sustainable. And at that time, we focused very much on alternative approaches. Uh, and uh, one especially would be the subsurface drip irrigation. And it was very much uh, popular to look at this in the Central Valley of California, uh, rather than using surface irrigation. And so we have some experimentation, and then you can see here a simulation with the hydroscodes from the drip line in this particular uh, at this particular uh, location. Yeah. We are very much concerned uh, about uh, the shape of the moisture front around the drip line. So if you have a uh, uh, a coarse soil much of the water would go down. It would not necessarily be, let me look at the, the next slide here. It would not be necessarily a, a very uh, cylindrical distribution. And here you can see here the uh, numerical and the uh, measured data are very close. For clay soils or fine textured soils, you would get a relatively cylindrical distribution for sandy soils, coarse textured soils. It would going down much more. Another side to this is uh, not just how to irrigate, but also when to irrigate. And this is actually, I thought it would be nice to also done with the hydroscopes, but uh, uh, where people would irrigate depending upon the stress of water in the root zone. And this is a, uh, uh, an experiment that was done as well as simulations by Sharon Simonek and uh, Lazarovic uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where you would place the tensiometer in the root zone uh, and then you would uh, start irrigating when the tensiometer would indicate a certain stress, in this case about uh, minus uh, 40 centimeters. Uh, and then you would irrigate 
until the tensiometer gives you a much uh, a value much closer to uh, saturation and then stop. This is without vegetation and here with vegetation, if I did this right. You can see here that it is basically automated. And so we have an issue of not just how to irrigate, but when and how much to irrigate. Another one, uh, and I, I kind of like this uh, particular slide. Uh, uh, we worked with uh, uh, Altaf Sial, uh, a friend, a uh, colleague from, uh, from Pakistan, uh, where you can see here they use these pitchers for uh, irrigation. Actually, these pitchers are also sometimes used for, uh, for uh, cooling uh, their homes. Uh, and then the issue was what would be the distribution of water when this was used for irrigation. So the advantage of this is, of course, very, very uh, efficient. Uh, you put water in the picture, it would uh, slowly move out through the walls. And if you have a good baker, he can uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, bake the pictures uh, with a certain permeability of the walls. Uh, and of course, this is not not larger scale uh, mechanized uh, agriculture, but it's uh, still very useful for uh, legumes and other things. It has been used a lot in uh, in uh, North Africa in the beginning, uh, Iran and other places. And one of the issues was, I thought was quite quite interesting was if you use small pictures or the large pitches, if you would get uh, different distributions. And, and it was not really the case, as we could show with our numerical simulations. These are uh, issues about freshwater use. Uh, I want to show another example, completely different, but basically still uh, with the same idea of looking at water flow and contaminant transport, uh, in this case related to mining and milling operations. Of course, there's a lot of pollution going on also by uh, in, you know, the mining milling industry. Uh, here are some examples, a copper gold mine, I think it's in Papua New Guinea. In Brazil, we have uh, lots of issues with what we call norms. These are natural occurring radioactive materials, so when people uh, uh, are mining certain chemicals, uh, the natural, uh, the, 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 the rocks uh, occur some natural uh, radioactive materials, especially uranium. Uh, and so uh, there's a concern about whether or not these concentrations are too high. And also here, a nuclear waste site is also in Brazil uh, that is causing uh, lots of problems. And then a few other uh, data here about uh, these problems also in the US. Yeah. I want to show you one example of this that we uh, addressed with the hydrous codes. This is actually a, a mining milling complex in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, I'm going to call it the metal uh, and not specify what exactly was being mined uh, to give a little bit confidential uh, information and uh, not, not, not to make it too public, but uh, it shows here a complex uh, where uh, the rock was being crushed in a uh, in this leaching area and then it was leached with uh, sulfate, uh, sulfuric acid, and then uh, it would end up in the holding ponds. Uh, after which uh, they will be processed uh, by the complex itself for, for whatever the metal, uh, whatever the metal were to be. You know, uh, actually, what what they what they found is one of these holding ponds, the water level or liquid level, I should say, started decreasing. Very nasty material again, a pH of about one one and a half, uh, very high concentrations of the metal. And first they thought that it was a problem of evapotranspiration or evaporation from the surface, but then they discovered that the uh, geomembrane at the bottom uh, started leaking. And so they uh, had a lot of uh, observation in other wells uh, where they looked at the contaminant plume. The surface plot here, uh, and you can see that uh, it well actually, when you go back, uh, the line of transport was roughly in this way here. Uh, 
uh, with the origin. And you can see that uh, it was moving here from east to west. Uh, and what we did was actually a cross section. We tried to simulate that with a cross section, both the sulfate as well as the metal itself. You can see here this holding pond uh, where the um, geomembrane was uh, punctured. We had some clay here. Then we had natural soils, uh, uh, subsurface soil here, a uh, more or less granular aquifer and a uh, fissured aquifer. Think about a uh, slightly fractured uh, rock material. So we tried to simulate, simulate that. Uh, here's the sulfate plume that was uh, uh, simulated over a period of five years. Uh, here is the observation well that was critical for the metals, not necessarily for the uh, sulfate plume. Uh, actually, when the sulfate, when the uh, leak was detected, the sulfate already completely uh, uh, traversed that uh, uh, line between the source and the observation well. Yeah. But you can see here it goes down, and then it picks up by the uh, groundwater, uh, and then moves. Uh, uh, away from the site. So a little bit stays in the capillary fringe region here uh, in the subsurface. Yeah. These are some simulations of the metal plume. You can see also it goes down, but the time frame is much, much larger. Stuff moves very, very slow uh, and then eventually to the right. Uh, one of the things I'll show you in a minute the uh, comparison with some data, but uh, one of the things that we noticed when we did the simulation is that uh, below in the unsaturated zone part, below the uh, holding pond, a lot of material remains and it would be leaking very slowly into the saturated zone. Uh, and this actually was something that uh, could have been used to advantage instead of just repairing the geomembrane and then keep on going, they could have digged this up here and then really minimized uh, future pollution of the subsurface. We call it the shadow of the waste site here. And these were some uh, comparisons of the uh, simulations with three observation nodes very close to the uh, monitoring well. Uh, and then here, these are some data that we needed to use to get a dual porosity non equilibrium type uh, formulation. Not that we would believe necessarily all the simulations, but it gives a little bit of a uh, view of uh, what would happen with the metal in the future. Many other applications, I'm coming uh, very close to the end, uh, that uh, we applied the hydroscopes to it. Uh, here are some uh, applications, uh, but there are really hundreds, if not thousands, of papers now already published uh, about this from, uh, you know, typical agricultural surface drip sprinkler irrigation, good water uptake again, uh, pesticides, point non, uh, non point source pollution, reactive waste, landfills. We worked a lot with landfill covers, how to make the system most uh, efficient. Tunnel, highway design, flow around buried objects, and so on, and virus here, virus, bacteria, transport. I encourage you to have a look at this particular website. There are many, many examples uh, and papers that uh, have been using these hydroscopes, including actually very specific pre-programmed examples. So there's a link here that you can uh, look at if needed. Yeah. As a summary, Environmental problems, we're facing this uh, and we have to address that. And at the same time, we have enormous progress. You know, when we look at irrigation, it started really about three, four thousand years ago, the, you know, whatever you believe, but, uh, but you look at the partial differential equations that we developed to describe these things numerically, it's less than a hundred years. The Richards equation was done in, what is it, 1931. The amount of publications that are being published now, it's enormous. We are aware here, actually, this last one, we are aware of the problems. There's global co collaboration, presumably. Yeah. We have new methods. Vertical farming is becoming quite popular, green roofs. Yeah. And then all things 
are, are site specific. This is what I want to uh, stress and that, that, that we are now aware of. You know, when, for example, we look at uh, drip irrigation, uh, it minimizes the amount of water that will be used for crop production. But sometimes you have to be a little bit uh, more flexible about it because sometimes uh, when you have the drainage, uh, uh, farmers uh, down gradient may need to use also water. Yeah, so it depends everything what the specific conditions are. Then a couple of other things. Well, uh, this here uh, is, is reflected by that earlier, remember, uh, graph I showed that everything is increasing. So the problems are increasing. Our insight is increasing. And you can see the problems and our solutions. And it really you know, makes me a little nervous. Are we staying ahead of the problems or not? State of the art, state of the practice. There's a lot of difference still there, not just just in terms of 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 of, of uh, topics that uh, you know, or, or techniques that are being used, but also between disciplines and geographically, and then the future. And then going back to this, it makes me nervous. You know, everything is accelerating. What's happening 100 years from now? Are we concerned not just about children, but our grandchildren? That's kind of uh, uh, what I wanted to say. I uh, again thanks uh, the uh, conference organizers uh, uh, for uh, having me participate in this. Uh, very interesting. I think the topics uh, are very urgent, uh, and I would like to leave it by this. So thanks again, and I want to thank also all the collaborators that worked with me over the years in uh, especially the modeling part, but also the applications to various. Uh, uh, problems. Thanks.